Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&As. Looks like we have questions across both Floatplane and Patreon this time, so let's jump right in and start with Floatplane. Brenovich980 says they're trying to connect a Raspberry Pi 3B running RetroPie to a consumer Sony Trinitron CRT via component video, YPBPR. The current connection is Raspberry Pi via the HDMI to component video converter, similar to the one that I show off on Amazon. And when turned on, the screen shows two images, off-center and skewed at a roughly 45-degree angle. I already know it's coming. The CRT works normally, and the Pi's resolution has been set to 480p. Any ideas? So that's exactly the problem. Um, all of the, almost all, I'd say 99.9% .9 of CRTs that have component video inputs only support 15 kilohertz, which means 240p or 480i, not 480p. You'll stumble across some consumer grades that do, but it's generally only professional video monitors. Um, so that is absolutely your issue. Luckily though, it's it's pretty easy to fix that. All you need to do is set a different config.txt file um, and just change the parameters in that, and it will force a, essentially a 240p resolution. Uh, I think the nickname for it is super resolution or something because it keeps the normal uh, vertical height but uh, has some like 10 times the uh, horizontal width and it's a timing that the Raspberry Pi can generate that drives everything crazy except CRTs because CRTs don't tell resolution, they tell refresh rates and stuff. So uh, that's how it would work for you. There's a thread up on Schmups that has a link to exactly what to do. I'll post a link. Um, I'll just reply to your post with it. Uh, and then, you know, the description is here in the video, but I'll just uh, reply to your post with a link to that. Um, and just check that out and, and see if that does it for you. It should work. There should be uh, no issues whatsoever. The only problem that you would run into is uh, if everything is done properly, it should work with all CRTs, but it probably isn't going to work with a capture card. So you wouldn't be able to do something like split the signal and have one go to the capture card and one go to a monitor. Super resolution. Um, and it might. depends on a many different factors. I just mean for, you know, keep your expectations in check for this experience. I'm 99% sure you could get this running on your CRT without any issues, and anything after that might be a little bit tricky. So um, hopefully uh, I was able to point you in the right direction, and it works. Over on Patreon, Samson Wick asked, When it comes to consoles, I like to do all the work myself. I often get more fun out of modding and repairs than I do playing games these days. I know the feeling. Uh, thing is, when it comes to arcade stuff, I kind of feel the opposite. I would rather buy something that just works. I've been kicking around the idea of buying a custom arcade cabinet to play all of my favorite games. When it comes to custom arcade cabinets, it seems there are a ton of companies willing to build one for you, but most of them seem like they're just using a PC loaded with MAME or Hyperspin, and I'm more interested in something with wider compatibility, something where I might be able to switch out the MAME PC for a Mr. or a genuine arcade board later on, and maybe have them installed side by side. I think this means I need to look for cabinets that incorporate a JAMA harness, but I barely know what JAMA is. Does anyone do custom work like this? So, excellent question, and it's um, it's something that all of us that deal with arcade boards are kind of dealing with right now. Um, I believe there's a brand new LCD-based arcade machine available that has video inputs built in. Lon from Lon.tv just did a video on it, and you're able to interface anything into that. A Mr., a Raspberry Pi, a computer, original consoles through a scaler. Uh, because it's PC monitor based, I imagine it would even work well with the OSSC because there's tends to be more compatibility with computer monitors than TVs, depending on the year you bought it and all that stuff. So that would be my suggestion is try to uh, look into that first, because you're talking about all new components. You could assemble it yourself, no problem. And then it's just a matter of treating your arcade boards and your consoles as if they were going to a TV. You know, you find yourself a good scaler. Um, I think the RetroTank products are perfect for stuff like this. But if you know, if you want to tweak and get the get perfection out of it, the OS to see is, is the device to buy if you don't already own one. Um, so that's kind of the easiest one. The other thing that you could do is kind of make your own cabinet-ish. Uh, so somebody I know took a 
uh, a music keyboard stand. So, you know, the musical instrument, a keyboard, they took a professional stand, which is meant to be banged on live in, uh, you know, in concert. And they use that as their arcade stick stand. And then they just have a TV or a CRT TV or monitor up on a shelf somewhere. Um, and it gives them the, the exact feel that they would of an arcade machine, but you don't have to build custom wood. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. And same thing. Then you just use super guns and, uh, you know, and RGB cables and stuff in order to get into that TV. Or if, you know, you just want to get a giant consumer grade TV, you know, you could mod it for RGB. You could just do a, use a transcoder to get RGB to component, depending where you're located. So, I mean, all of those are, are pretty good. Uh, and I think that that takes care of most people. But if you're looking for an actual arcade cabinet, something that, you know, it's a legit arcade with a CRT in it, with a JAMA interface, my suggestion is to find one that's affordable in your neighborhood that you're able to get to you that has a JAMA harness. Now, there's a few other things you can get. There's newer ones that have different interfaces and all that stuff. But generally, if you're just looking for stand-up arcades, that's probably what you're going to find. Uh, and then you need to uh, find different ways to get the boards to work on it. Now, most boards probably just need a kick harness for buttons over three buttons, three or over four buttons. So buttons five and six uh, are going to need something called a, hick, a kick harness. So you wire that directly in. Um, you know, there's different uh, different setups once you go down this rat hole. You know, if you want to interface consoles into your arcade setup, um, Tim Worthington's got a new line of products for that. I'm not sure if they're released yet, but I talked about them on the weekly roundup a while back. So that's kind of another way to do it. And you could also look for uh, JAMA interfaces for the Raspberry Pi and the Mr. I don't know if the Mr. one's released yet, but I've seen pictures floating around. So that's kind of the best way to do it. Um, if you want an official arcade cabinet, there's just a lot more work that goes into stuff because you're not just, in most cases, you're not just plugging stuff in. You would need to worry about the wiring harnesses for extra buttons and, you know, the, is the monitor going to line up right? Is it, you know, has that CRT only been calibrated to like Mortal Kombat and then you throw in Street Fighter and, you know, the screen's a little bit off. It's something that you're really going to have to decide for yourself. Uh, there's things like candy cabs and sit down cabs that, that are meant to have multiples in them but it's all of the same issues that you would find elsewhere. So it's my opinion that unless you are strictly looking for that stand-up arcade look, um, I would try any of the other methods I talked about. You know, the new one that's LCD-based, uh, I still got to test that for lag. Uh, I don't know if Lon did. I should text him and see uh, if he doesn't have a time sleuth. I got to make sure I get him one of those. Um, but, you know, stuff like that is, is easier if you want the stand-up experience or just having a CRT on a shelf with a nice stand for your arcade stick. Whether you choose to sit or stand, either way, I think that's what a lot of people end up doing. And that's why super guns are getting more popular. So hopefully I kind of laid out the right path for you to take. But any other questions, obviously, please feel free to ask. ABO Hiccups wants to know what my FPGA clone console wish list is that I want to see from Analog after the Pocket and Analog 8. My wish was uh, Nintendo 64. So um, to be honest, from Analog specifically, I don't know if I have a request because just remember the context of Analog. You know, Kevin does the FPGA cores and the hardware design. Um, they have somebody else, I believe it's, or it could be Ernesto, I'm not sure... I haven't spoken to them in a while, uh, but they have somebody else doing the mechanical design of the cases. That's why the cases look so good. They're not just like generic cases. Somebody put some real thought into that. Um, and, and in that setup, I think that Kevin's going to concentrate on things that are obviously going to affect the most people. So Super Nintendo, Genesis, and everything that goes with those, obviously. Uh, I still think the Analog 8 is going to be a, a pretty cool addition to that, especially because they play original cartridges. So after the Analog pocket which would take original cartridges from the handhelds i'm really not sure what i would want next from them i i would just want whatever could get them whatever could hit the the widest target market because those products are designed for people that want to take something out of a box plug their cartridges in and have it work no setup no messing around they want a zero lag accurate experience 
that just plugs it in. Um, which I'm, I'm saying that obviously is a compliment, certainly not a criticism, but I, I'm not really sure what I would want after that. I think I would just see what's the most feasible core to, to release and based on sales, what's the you know, what's the next most popular one. Um, but if, if the question is, what's my FPGA core wish list, the Mortal Kombat's, no doubt, because that also takes care of the Midway stuff, which would lay the groundwork for NBA Jam and a few others. Um, of course, I'm biased because MK1 is my favorite fighting game. I know it's not the best fighting game out there, but it is my favorite. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that's that's my thoughts on that. My wish list for analog is what's going to reach the most amount of people and make them the most money because obviously, you know, if they don't make money, they can't continue to make these things. So uh, my wish list for analog is what's best for them. My selfish wish list for me is Mortal Kombat's. Travis Barker had a question and a few statements. I'll do the question first. Uh, Travis wants to know if there's any way to play 3DS or DS games on a big screen. Um, so the options that were available were USB-based mods that meant that you had to play them through a PC on your computer, and those were mostly designed for capture and streaming, so you would still actually be playing on the handheld in most cases and just using the PC to capture. Um, you could find boxes called the Nitro DS, and uh, I don't think I've ever seen one for the 3DS, but for the original Nintendo DS, they come in two types. One is the Nitro DS emulator, and the other is the Nitro DS capture. Uh, they're both blue boxes with a Nintendo DS attached, and they have uh, SNES multi-out style outputs that can go up to S-Video. Um, and if you're playing on uh, either a CRT or I guess through a retro tank, you could uh, you would need two retro tanks then because it's uh, one for each output. You could play them that way. You play them on the handheld uh, DS that is attached to the device. And you could, you know, you could watch them on a screen. I believe I measured and it has about a frame of lag uh, over the original. Um, but I used a 240 frame per second camera to do so. And I did it like three years ago or two years ago or something. So I would like to retest. But lag is reasonable. It's certainly not three or four frames of variable lag like a terrible scaler has. Uh, so that's probably a good thing for now. Just a few things to remember about those Nitro DS boxes. Uh, number one is that the one that's labeled capture works exactly as I just said, but the one labeled emulator means that you have to have a USB cord attached to it and you have to load games via a PC interface. Um, so it's a little bit more of a pain, but those are generally a lot cheaper because they're easier to use. I've seen these wildly vary in price over the years, so I have no idea what they're going for now, but it's probably not going to be cheap, but they'll be cheaper, I guess. Uh, and the other thing is the dip, sweating, dip switch settings on the back. I believe there is one setting that allows you to have both screens out of one output, but in interlaced mode. So I guess it'd be okay if you were streaming and then wanted to try to deinterlace the footage in real time or something. That might be a little easier, but I, I still just like the thought of the two, uh, the two individual 240p outputs. So that's that's about it for now but of course there's emulation options that you could use as well um the faster the pc the less lag you're going to have it's certainly going to be more than the one frame of lag that you would get out of the nitro but you know it's it's obviously an option that i wanted to mention and i believe there's a few different people that have toyed with video output for handhelds uh, but as of now, all of the ones that I know of are in proof of concept stages. So uh, it's one thing to show a console or, or to show a product working, like to show a beta design. And it's another to get it into a package that could be resold and installed. And those are two wildly different things. So obviously no disrespect to anybody working on these projects, but I don't think we're going to see a short term solution for this. So right now I would suggest emulation or if you're really super into it, find one of those Nitro DSs. Um, and I think I know somebody with an emulator for sale. So private message me if you want one. It's not going to be cheap though, but uh, at least it's a solution for you. You then have to figure out how to use the PC interface, which I've never done, but whatever. Uh, the other comments that you made, uh, wish list for analog is transparent pricing, uh, a console to play the 3DS games, um, and why can't they make a plastic NES like the Mega SG and Super NT, especially when there's the AVS already available for 150 shipped. So all good points. Um, their consoles are expensive because a lot does go into them, but I do agree. I wish they would find a way to spin off a zero feature version. And uh, I know like 
everybody that's super into this stuff's heart probably sank when I say that, but I do wish they were able to spin off a cheap version that's essentially a replacement for a Hyperkin console that doesn't suck. So, you know, no extra options, no video options, no tweaking. You just plug in your carts and go with nothing else but as cheap as possible. That's a lot of work, though, um, and that would require hiring more people. So I'm certainly not going to speculate on why they haven't done that. Uh, but the retro USB AVS is absolutely a perfect solution. It's an excellent console. I don't have a single complaint about it. There are features I would like to see, but there's certainly no complaints at all. I think it just works great and everybody should, anybody who just needs to get their NES or Famicom cartridges on a flat screen would really appreciate how it works. Um, so if you're waiting for analog to come out with one, uh, I think they are going to be making a plastic one. Total speculation, but they trademarked the name Analog 8. So I imagine, you know, with with delays with everything, it might be next year. But I imagine at some point they'll have a console that's, that's kind of like their version of the AVS with a bunch of features in it, just like all the other consoles. So, you know, while I'm always uh, super critical of expensive things and I tend to be critical of analog I am a giant fan of the things that they do um, and of, of course and a fan of Kevtris's as well I just always like to keep everything in perspective for people so yeah at the moment if anybody's looking for just a way to get their NES games on a flat screen you cannot beat the retro USB AVS it's 150 bucks and it works perfect Blackguard wanted to chime in about the discussion of ports on the back of flat screens. Last week, I was talking about how some of the VGA ports are labeled RGB, and Blackguard says technically RGB is more correct than VGA because the port accepts RGB HV in a wide variety of resolutions, while VGA refers to a specific resolution of 640 by 480. Uh, that is 100% true. I just, uh, I think all of these things are probably confusing depending on your use case. So if you've never heard of RGB or, or anything related to your classic game consoles, then yes, then labeling the port RGB is probably a safer bet for these manufacturers. But if you're a retro gaming and you see RGB, you think, oh, is this 15 kilohertz compatible? So while we might be discussing semantics here, I think it's a, a very good point. And, uh, you know, I'm glad you brought it up. I probably should have mentioned that at the end of my rant. But yeah, naming is always weird. And this is also why I used to use VGA connectors for a lot of my consoles uh, and had a custom setup. And I just decided I don't want to do that because no matter what, stuff like this is going to happen. There's going to be naming issues, port issues, and people are going to assume it's one and not the other. And that's why I'm sticking with SCART. Just so wherever my consoles go after me, there shouldn't be any confusion. If you see a big, ugly SCART cable, you know, you should be able to Google that and go, oh, okay, it's RGB. So uh, thanks for, for chiming in on that. Next is a question from Shuryor. I'm so sorry. I wish I could pronounce that name. Your name sounds so much cooler than Bob. Very, uh, I'm always jealous of cooler names. If any way that you could teach me how to pronounce that, I'd love to try to get it right. But um, your question is, they, you have an XRGB Mini Frame Meister, and while you're satisfied with the picture, uh, you're worried about input latency, and have been considering buying an OSSC. Um, should you do that, or wait for the Pro, or keep it? So I kind of have um, mixed opinions about this because the FrameMeister is an excellent device, but it was very expensive. So while I wouldn't recommend anybody get it now simply because of cost, you already own it. And with the Firebrand X profiles, you can get a pretty spectacular signal that's compatible with every capture card, every TV. Uh, so it's, it's still a solid solution. Moving to an OSSC would get you slightly better colors uh, and zero input latency, but you're not going to be 100% sure if it's compatible with your TV until you actually plug it in with your consoles and use it. So that's that's always a legitimate fear. Um, and waiting for the Pro, you know, it's with technology, I've taken the stance forever now that I don't wait on something that I could possibly need because you never know what the delays are. Um, in your situation, you already have a great uh, scaler. So maybe, yeah, maybe wait for the pro. It's probably going to be delayed just like everything else these days. So, um, you know, keep that in mind, but maybe it is worth just waiting on the pro, but I guess 
My suggestion in your situation would be to, if possible, borrow an OSSC and try it out with all your consoles and see if there's compatibility issues or if it works. Um, if there are no compatibility issues, maybe consider selling the FrameMeister on eBay because it's still a device that streamers might really benefit from. People that game on CRT monitors and then take the output of the CRT into the FrameMeister to their capture card. It's still probably the best solution out there as long as money is not an issue. Uh, so you might be able to make a few bucks, sell it for a fair price, and get yourself an OSSC. Um, but you know, either way, you have an excellent setup now. So it's not something. It's not like you have one of those generic SCART to HDMI boxes in which I would be suggesting that you try to move away from that as soon as possible. The latency on the FrameMeister is much much better than that. No, you know, no comparison. So um, I would kind of just think about it and kind of figure out what's best for your situation. Uh, and also, thank you very much for the compliment. You said you've been subscribed for a while and have watched about 70% of my videos. Oh man, I hope the older ones aren't too painful. I like to think I've gotten at least a little bit better over the years of these, but uh, thank you very much for your support. Marky Mark 5127 wants to know if it's possible for the RetroTINK 2X Pro to get a 480p pass-through mode. Um, so... I, you know, I'm not Mike Chi. I can't answer that question definitively, but as far as I know about those chips, um, it would have to be a different kind of hardware to do that. The chips that these signals are passed through uh, would need to at least know what the signal is in order to pass it through, I think. Now, that's my guess. That's speculation. Um, I'm pretty sure that is the case, but you would want to contact Mike Chi directly just to double check. Uh, I don't think there'd be some kind of firmware update that would allow it, but you know, it's worth asking the, the person who designed it directly. I would just keep your expectations low because I think if that's something that could be done, Mike would have already done it, but it is an excellent question. So sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Chris Manichek had a couple more questions this week, and I'm going to break them up into uh, different sections for different answers just because it's easier for me to do it that way. Uh, question number one is about JP21. We talked a bit about that last week uh, and how it applies to people's setups and why people use it. Um, it's still my thoughts that if you're starting out in this right now, or maybe if you only have one or two JP21 cables to just go get everything on SCART. Uh, but many people, for whatever the reasons they might have, uh, just got full JP21 setups. And unless you wanted to replace every cable, which in most cases, I don't think you would ever need to, um, and then you would probably want to stick with JP21. So I totally get it. It's just something I want to make sure that people know that if you're just starting out, or if you have the ability to switch over now before it's too late and you buy all JP21s, then, uh, then stick with SCART. It's just going to make everything everything easier overall. The actual questions on it, um, before committing to get another JP21 switch, do I recommend going with a different switch? Would you gain signal or picture quality with a different switch? I've never actually used a Selecti. Um, I didn't have time to test it. I think I've reached out to the people that make it and they're going to be sending me that and something else to test at some point, but all of that stuff's delayed with everything. Um, and I'm pretty backlogged as well. So I don't know when I would actually have time to do these real in-depth tests. I mean, it's easy to slap it on a scope and say, all right, it doesn't change the voltage, do my link test. All right, I don't think the signals changed, but the testing that I did on the original G-SCARTs were, I mean, that was hours and hours and hours of testing to make sure that it still performed well. And I don't know if I'd have the time to do that coming up. So uh, I don't, as long as the switch is made correctly, you shouldn't notice any issues. Um, I've seen other switches out there that were made pretty badly and you do get interference issues. I've seen some that are just, you know, I would never recommend used. Those are usually just older equipment that's not brand new and available anymore. So I, I don't know about the Selecti. I would like to try it. Um, if it's the one I'm thinking of, it's the, the bigger one with all the different options. I'd really like to try it because it seems like a good option. I just uh, don't know when I would be able to get to that. Um, also, any suggestions where you could find high quality JP21 cables? I would just try contacting Retro Access, um, and at the very least, you could use their custom cable builder. It's going to be expensive, but you know, 
in that case, I would just ask yourself, what's more expensive? If you, It sounds like you already have a ton of cables that are JP21, and if you're only looking for three or four more, just buy the really expensive, really good quality coax custom ones from Retro Access and be done with it. Whereas if you were looking, you know, if you only had four consoles and you were looking to connect 15 total, it might be cheaper to just, you know, buy their off-the-shelf cables for all of them than, than to try to replace it. So, uh you know, it's, you said you have a very large setup, so I would just go to Retro Access and uh, and check out their custom cable builder and make sure that they can make those for you. Next from Chris, uh, they have an amazing ViewSonic 19-inch CRT, which they've owned since they were a kid. Uh, the excellent picture was obvious, and years later, when they were a bit older, they did some research and find out and found out it was very highly reviewed and one of the top few monitors at the time. Recently, they wanted to try to set up a station with Dreamcast or another console and try to make use of the BNC connection. They asked another knowledgeable video person how they could do this, and they were told the refresh rate was not compatible with consoles, but wanted to ask if this is true or if you could still use it. Um, so I'm going to go with 99.9% .9 chance, no, you can't just plug like a SCART to BNC connector in it. However, you can use a device to convert it, uh, to convert those signals to VGA. So the best two uh, things that you could do at this moment um, are take... Uh, either a SCART, not JP21, to HDMI box, like the RetroTank 2X SCART, and then output that into an HDMI to VGA converter and kind of go from there. Um, and that would give you an excellent picture. As long as you turned on scan lines, it's going to look very close to the original. I'll have a video on this soon, actually. In fact, if you could hold out a couple weeks, uh, you could see for yourself all the differences. However, the RetroScaler A1 might be more up your alley. It's going to require a custom BN... Uh, so it would be a custom JP21 female to VGA style adapter. So you would have to have probably Retro Access make that for you. But then you could go direct JP21 into it, and it automatically detects and doubles the signal, uh, and it also adds scan lines. And it's expensive. It's you know it's more than twice the price of the 2x SCART. But if you're really looking for you know the best possible quality on a VGA monitor, um, then you might want to look into that. You know, once again, you could just wait for the video to come out if you would, uh, if you wanted to to see for yourself what the difference is. I think most people that just have a VGA monitor that want to use it for gaming would be more than happy with the 2x cart through a converter. Uh, and those converters are all linked on the Amazon affiliates page, and those are twenty dollars ish, sometimes much less, and they offer zero or add zero lag to it. So uh, it's certainly a great solution um, and of course you know that monitor would be perfect for your Dreamcast setup as well uh, and I guess last week you asked about the Dreamcast setup with VGA on LCD and I said the device would handle both signals but they're mo uh, both 16 by 9 and 4 by 3 signals but their monitor is 16 by 10 would that create an issue um, I'm not really sure uh, if you're lucky you'll end up with black bars and it won't uh, it won't stretch anything um, if the monitor does size it correctly, it could soften the image, but maintain the original aspect ratio. So that's something that I would just try and see if you like the results or not. Now, keep in mind, too, sometimes uh, the way things are scaled might really work out for you. And uh, I think I already mentioned this, so I'll be super quick. But in my personal setup, when I set the DC HDMI to 960p, so it doubles 480p, uh, my OLED TV stretches that so nicely and the sharpness of the integer scale the 960 mixed with the softness of how my TV panel stretches that to 4k makes it look really nice so um, even if it does is doing some stretching I would just give it a try and see how it looks because who knows maybe that exact monitor will scale everything perfect for you Kirk wants to know if I know of any good videos or information on adjusting color and brightness on consumer grade TVs using the 240p test suite. Uh, I would check out the Retro Tech channel. I just posted an article about um, his geometry calibration on the website now for anybody that wants to check that out. Um, Retro Tech's been doing some videos for a while. I don't know why I haven't covered more of Steve's work. I genuinely don't. I, I should have been. My bad. <laughs> but uh, those videos are pretty good. Um, you could also kind of read through the 240p test beat wiki and things that they suggest. There's some pretty good information on why some of the test patterns are the way they are and how you could use that to calibrate brightness. Um, as far as adjusting color, a lot of that, um, you're really going to need to have a good eye for it. Um, I don't 
uh, you know, I, I don't have a good eye for color calibration, but I do for most other things. It's kind of weird. Uh, but I guess, you know, you could find different tools for it, but I'm not sure if any modern automatic tools work well with CRTs. Because right now you could buy stuff like you turn on your uh, your modern TV in a dark room, set this camera up to it, and um, it'll tell you what settings to change. There's different calibration stuff that you could buy and I think even rent for, uh, for things like that. But I don't know if they would work with CRTs or if there was ever stuff like that out there. Certain BVMs have a white balance and brightness calibration thing, but that tool is expensive and it would require a BVM, not a consumer grade TV. So I think I would just start with the 240p test suites documentation and the RetroTech channel and then just kind of go from there and see, see what hole you fall down in calibration after that. And also just keep in mind that it's a realistic expectation that you're never going to get a CRT perfect. You're just going to get it good enough to keep you happy. So I would just kind of keep that in mind. You're never going to get flawless, perfect calibration across every single console and every resolution and every brightness. It's just, it's, um, it's almost an unattainable goal. So I would just stick with good enough that you're happy with the picture. Uh, also, thank you very much for the kind words. Always appreciated. And hopefully we'll have word on the wiki soon. So thanks, Kirk. Well, that's it for this week. If you're new to these Q&As, please ask any question you'd like wherever it is that you support in the latest Q&A page. The way these videos work, I can't really go back and find what questions haven't been answered in previous episodes. So keep any question you have in the latest Q&A post. And if for whatever reason I miss it, please either message me or just ask it again the following week. It's always a mistake. I never skip over questions. I usually just mess something up in post or accidentally delete the file or something like that. So um, any questions you have, just Stick to the support pages. Uh, I do have the comments on on YouTube, but this is very respectfully something that's just an interaction between myself and the supporters. And while I do want to share them for everybody else to be able to enjoy, uh, the questions are really uh, a thank you and to anybody that supports, as well as my way of trying to give back and show my thanks to all of this. So, no disrespect to anybody who just uh, just listens. I answer thousands of questions on all other videos, but I, I don't really go into the Q and A comments because of that. So, uh, and of course, you know, if you're not able to support, that's totally understandable, but consider telling other people because this channel, all of the behind the scenes stuff and all of the work that goes into it is all driven by support. So without your help, none of this stuff could happen. So thank you very much. If you are a supporter, if you're not, that's totally cool, but maybe spread the word and hopefully other people will sign up as well. Thank you all so much and I'll see you next week.